Welcome to The Referral with me, Dr. Curran. I'm a surgeon in the NHS, and this is your weekly podcast where we talk about all things medicine, science, and health, and we chat to guest experts where we debunk myths and offer you actionable, insightful, evidence-based strategies to improve your life. And today's topic is a very interesting one. We're talking about an organ that's invisible, but it's in plain sight. It's the Swiss Army knife of organs. It helps you regulate your body temperature. It keeps you safe from microbes and other bacteria and viruses. It's part of your immune system. It helps you interact with your environment. If you haven't guessed what it is, it is the skin. We're gonna be covering skincare basics, essentials, and talking about acne, which seems to affect everyone at some point in their life. And to join me to discuss this, we've got a skincare expert, Dr. Anjali Marto, who's a medical and cosmetic dermatologist with her own clinic in London's Harley Street. There's absolutely no doubt that layer upon layer of skincare product that people are using in the morning and the evening is disrupting skincare barriers. They're poorer for it, and their skin's no better for it, and their mental health is worse for it. Dr. Anjali Marto. Now, you're a dermatologist, but tell me and tell everyone watching and listening what you get up to on a daily basis and an interesting fact about what you do. So, dermatologists, um, we are trained to deal with over 3,000 conditions that affect the skin, the hair, and the nails. And I think that's one thing people don't realize about us. They think of skin, but hair and nails also fall into our remit. I also subspecialize in laser and a little bit of cosmetic work as well. So my average day can vary from seeing people with medical inflammatory skin conditions, so things like acne, rosacea, eczema, psoriasis, to doing mold checks for skin cancers, to doing laser treatments or a little bit of injectables for anti-aging. So it's the whole gamut, really, of skin conditions that can affect you on any part of your body at any age. Now, you mentioned acne as obviously one of the... You know, things that you deal with. Yeah. And acne is seemingly affecting everyone, sort of over 80% of people who get it at some point in their lives. That's right. Is that, would you say, a bulk of the work and sort of the patients you see in your clinic? Yeah. And I think partly there is a selection bias of what I see. Um, I've been quite open talking about my own issues with acne growing up over the years. Mm. So I think there is a degree of me attracting people because I'm quite vocal about okay. the links between acne and mental health. Yeah. But I think in addition to that, yes, we see a lot of it because it's probably the most common skin condition. It does affect about 80% of people at some point. What is acne and why do people get it? So acne is a multifactorial skin disease. So what I mean by that is there is no one single cause mm. why it happens. So it's a complex interplay between a number of environmental factors and genetic factors. So it's partly related to hormones in the skin in particular what we call androgen hormones, mm. so testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, DHT. Now, even women produce these hormones, although we classically think of those as male hormones. So those hormones can act on oil glands in the skin. Our oil glands are in highest density on our face, our back, our chest, our shoulders, which is why those areas mm. are where people are acne prone. So the hormones, the plump, juicy oil glands, yep. chucking out more oil, and then our skin cells aren't behaving properly and they become sticky and clumpy. Yeah. The medical word for that is follicular hyperkeratinization. Mm. But essentially what it means is the skin cells aren't shedding or exfoliating properly. So they form plugs or blocked pores. Yeah. And then bacteria, which naturally live on the skin surface, a bacteria called C. acnes, mm. can then act on those blocked pores to create inflammation and those deep spots. Just for those people who are not so well versed in skincare, they talk about acne and you hear things like whiteheads, blackheads, mm. open, closed comedones. What is that simplified? What does all of that mean? So these are all different types of acne lesions. Okay, so it's all acne. It's all acne. Um, but it's almost the difference in acne, which is inflammatory, mm. and acne, which is not inflammatory. So generally speaking, it forms almost like a process as acne progresses. So when you've just got a couple of little blocked pores, your skin's a little bit oily and your skin's not exfoliating properly, you will get comedones. Yeah. So little blackheads or little whiteheads. So these are the tiny little bumps underneath mm -hmm. the skin. But as acne progresses, uh, for some people, not all, what will then happen is the C. acnes bacteria then becomes rather active on these blocked pores. And that's where you start to get the little raised bumps. So mm. this is where you get papules. So the redness. Exactly. But then as acne progresses, those little red bumps become 
larger red bumps. So they're quite deep, they're quite painful, they last for several weeks at a time. They're more likely to leave a mark or a scar. So then they become nodules or cysts. So they're sort of pus-containing, inflammatory yeah. now Exactly, lesions. exactly. But they're quite deep underneath the skin. So they're just a way, really, that we as dermatologists use to classify the skin and the degree or the severity of acne. The truth is, though, one person may have different types of lesions at one point in time. And when someone is suffering from acne, obviously there's a percentage of people who may just leave it alone and it resolves spontaneously. There's a percentage of people who try to pick at it and burst these papules yeah. and lesions. You know, clearly that's not a good idea yeah. to do at home, certainly anyway. Yeah. Uh, it may be okay for a dermatologist to do it, also a doctor in clinic. But what are the actual effects, apart from you know, pain and scarring, to yeah. then bursting your own pimples at home? Yeah, the, the main issue really is infection and scar. Infection, They're yeah. the big things that we'd be concerned about. And one of the things that we do know with patients who suffer with acne is there are also higher rates of anxiety. Mm. And anxiety itself can be related itself with things like skin picking. It worsens our acne as well. Yeah. So if you are somebody who's a bit anxious about your acne and you're picking your skin, we've got a medical word for that, acne excoriae. Wow. So people would rather than have the bump, they would rather scrape the bump away. Oof. So sometimes you see people and literally they've taken away the top layers of their skin and it's caused quite a lot of deep scarring. So when I see that, for example, so it's not a little bit of squeezing the odd spot, but it's a, almost a compulsive desire to want to pick away at the skin. You absolutely have to work with a good mental health professional as well as a dermatologist to get out of the habit of that kind of picking of the skin. Wow. I guess the more we figure out about the genetic factors, we can sort of try to stratify who will be at increased risk of acne. And, you know, a lot of people typically associate acne with teenagers having some hormonal fluctuations, but actually there's a significant population of adults and probably more adults now than ever yeah. with acne. That's in right. Their 30s, 40s, 50s. Yeah, it's interesting. So we actually inherit the number of oil glands that we have from our parents oh, at wow. birth. But those oil glands are relatively inactive. And it's androgen hormones during puberty mm. that cause that spike, which is why you start getting acne in teenage years. But if you look at adult data, about 20 to 40 percent of adult women will suffer with acne and about 8 percent of men. So it's significantly less in the male population. Yeah. And that is thought to be due to far less complex hormonal patterns that yes, are going on due to menstrual cycles. we're very simple creatures. Yeah, we have one main hormone that we worry about fluctuating. So I guess you see it more in men who may abuse uh, steroids, um, who may then see a significant fluctuation in the steroid hormone and get, you know, steroid-associated acne. Absolutely. So bodybuilders are the kind of the archetypal yeah. um, group that you would think of that with. And what's interesting is there are small studies on bodybuilders aged between 17 to 25 years looking at their whey protein consumption All right. and a link of potentially whey protein being the driver for truncal acne, so acne mm. on the shoulders or the back. But the issue there is often when people are competing in those types of sports, there are other things that may be also going on in the body that may not just be whey protein, for example, anabolic hormones, um, which may be having a part to play. So this is where the data can become a little bit murky to separate what's causing what. And I think you just mentioned the whey protein there, and there have been consistent myths, but also some evidence which point towards dairy, you know, increasing the risk of acne. But again, the data is you know, circumstantial. It's not a hard and fast dairy causes acne. Yeah. There's lots of limitations of studies which have pointed to that because, you know, you can't, you know, blind or randomize someone to milk or not milk yeah. in a study to actually figure out whether, you know, that's the causative factor in acne, can you? That's right. And I think the other thing is a lot of nutritional data is hard to interpret yeah. because you're recalling bias in terms of what people are telling you they've had right. 20 years ago, 10 years ago. I mean, I can't remember what I ate last <laughs> week, let alone what I was eating regularly 10 years ago. So that doesn't help. Now, that said, there probably is a small select group of people right. where dairy may have a part to play. The problem is we still don't know exactly how to stratify who those people would be. So we rely on a clinical history. And if somebody yeah. says that's the case, I would absolutely respect that. But that said, if it was as simple as dairy, I wouldn't have vegan patients. And I certainly have vegan patients with acne. Yeah, I've always been quite vocal on the fact that I believe that our current understanding of 
you know, the microbiome and the use of probiotics for the microbiome is more hype than health at the moment. I agree. Uh, and you're nodding, which is good. Yeah. And I feel as well that people abuse the fact that we know now about the presence of the microbiome to then say, you can now put probiotic supplements on your skin to maybe Indeed. influence your skin microbiome. Have you seen that sort of stuff in patients in your clinic and that sort of myth being perpetuated? Yeah, um, for gut and for topical yeah, as well, topical, both yeah. of them, absolutely. And and often the conversation that I will have is, you know, if we look at the gut microbiome specifically for skin conditions, you know, even if you have two identical twins, yeah. identical DNA, their gut microbiomes aren't identical. Totally different, yeah. So how very you know how much variation is there going to be between one person and the other the second thing is a lot of probiotics really just focus on bacteria yeah but we know that our microbiome is not just bacteria it's yeast and it's fungus and it's mold and it's viruses, viruses yeah so we're not accounting for that either exactly. so i think we just live in a day and an age where we just want to control as many things as that we can and i feel like diet is an easy thing that people feel that they can control and I think that's why often we go down that route of maybe I should take this supplement or that supplement, but we're better off eating real food oh, yeah. than taking supplements. I mean, I totally agree with you there on the supplements thing. And, you know, on that line of diet and skin, yeah. there clearly, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention there is some association between that. Yeah. What are some things that you would typically recommend to patients in terms of dietary factors yeah. that could at least help to support their skin health rather than a, you know, a golden bullet to yeah. you know, change it? What would that be? Yeah. So I always take top line being there is no specific diet that is good for your skin. Mm. There is no superfood that is yeah. good for your skin. A diet that is good for your skin is a diet that's one that's good for your general health. It's good for your gut and it's good for your heart and it's good for your lungs and every other part of your body. But the big ones that I get asked about, so dairy, which we've slightly touched on. So if we look at the clinical trial data that we've got on dairy, the evidence seems to be that low-fat dairy seems to be more of a problem mm. than full-fat dairy. Now, the question there then becomes, is that because when you remove the fat, you're left with the carbohydrates or the sugars? Right. So it's the sugar that might be driving it. So if someone says to me that every time they have dairy, they notice a flare up, like I said, I respect that. And I will say, fine. In that case, you could be that select group. It's a problem. Don't have it in your diet. Yeah. But if that's not the case and they've noticed no kind of variation in their skin, I would say, you know what? Reintroduce it and don't be scared of it. The second thing that I find is people blanketly cut out dairy because of mm, what they've read online. Yeah. And they always switch to plant milks, which is yeah. the natural alternative. But nearly everyone switches to oat milk. Mm. Now, the reason for that is because it tastes good. And it tastes good because it's full of sugar. <laughs> it's got the highest glycemic index really? of all plant-based milks. And sort of lower glycemic index foods are better for... For skin. Reducing flare-ups or potentially of chronic skin conditions. So... Acne in particular, particularly adult acne, yeah. there seems to be, again, limited data which shows that if you consume foods that have got a high glycemic index, so spike your blood sugar levels yeah. very, very quickly, that may potentially be one of the things that might drive acne. Now, it won't be the cause. Yeah. You've yeah, got to yeah. have the underlying tendency anyway, but it may well be a trigger. And again, that's not the case for everyone. So my approach there is it doesn't mean you can't have sugar in your diet. It just means that you just need to be sensible about how much sugar you're having in your diet. But what I don't think is great is cutting out dairy blanketly and then mm. putting oat milk in everything. You've swapped something which probably isn't a problem to something that we know has got a high glycemic index. And is more likely to be a problem. So I feel it's almost a bespoke, you know, a bespoke approach, management approach for each patient. Indeed. I mean, what are some other sort of basics, apart from reaching for medication yep. from a lifestyle point of view that you'd point people in the direction towards? You know, in terms of the bespoke approach, because we see a lot of acne, one of the drivers for acne, particularly in women, mm. which I see a lot of, is a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, yes. PCOS. It's underdiagnosed. It affects about 8 to 10% of the female population. And acne is one of the features that's associated with it. So often these patients will present to a dermatology clinic and you will screen them for the first time and find that. Interesting. So if I feel somebody has got other markers of PCOS, so I will always ask about menstrual cycles. I will always ask about hair in general as yeah. well. And family history. All of that stuff is important. Mm. 
But if there is any suggestion or that diagnosis is made in clinic, I do find with those people the glycemic index is quite important. And I will also recommend, again, in terms of improving insulin resistance, resistance training yes. and strength training at least to three times a week. Improve their body composition, Indeed. lowering the visceral fats, etc. Absolutely. So I think for that particular group, that's important. But then again, you know, from a practical point of view, we know that the skin doesn't work in isolation to other organs. How yeah. much sleep you're getting yes. is really important. Yeah. How much stress is in your life? Stress will exacerbate chronic inflammatory skin conditions. So a lot of this stuff, quite honestly, I think we know. We're mm. just very bad at following and we're looking for a magic bullet. Yeah. When it's actually a lot of it is getting enough sleep, managing your stress, making sure your diet is diverse, making sure that you're moving enough, you're doing resistance training, you're getting your heart rate up. I feel now that cosmetic dermatology, with the rise of a lot of wellness influencers, yeah. both celebrities, people like Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, but also, um, you know, people on TikTok and Instagram, uh, sort of influencers who have maybe left behind clinical dermatology and are fully into the sort of wellness fads. Do you think the rise of all of these things and celebrities online promoting the use of you know, dozens of different products in your skincare routine and us now, you know, bullying our skin with all of these various products that's disrupting the natural skin microbiome and resulting in all of these conditions. Is that a contributing factor, do you think? I think it's a huge issue. Um, and I can tell you, having practiced certainly as a consultant for nearly 10 years now and the kinds of things I was seeing about 10 years ago versus what I'm seeing now there's absolutely no doubt that layer upon layer of skincare product that people are using in the morning and the evening is disrupting skincare barriers. And clinic yesterday, I would say probably about half the women that I saw were using online products or prescription online products for anti-aging, and it had disrupted their skincare barrier. And that is a massive issue. So on one hand, I think, again, capitalist society, you know, and fear of missing out, we're told, first of all, you can't get old because getting old is terrible and it's the worst thing that can happen to you. Therefore, you need to be slapping all of these products yeah. onto your skin. Secondly, you obviously don't care enough about yourself if you're not using all of these products. So there is a degree of shame, I think, in friendship circles if you're the one friend that doesn't seem to care about your skin yeah. in the same way. So I think there are multiple issues playing into this at the moment. We've gone from, you know, if you look back several hundred years ago, medieval ages where people didn't shower, didn't have baths, and we don't know what sort of skin conditions they had, to then the invention of soap and then the skincare beauty industry. And then us now, especially if you look at, you know, Korea, they are obsessed with skincare even more so than, you know, the sort of UK, US, etc. And people have... 10, 12-step skincare routines, which mm. they're doing, spending a lot of money mm. on. And even if I look at myself, I never thankfully suffered with lots of acne as a kid growing up. I had occasional a couple of spots here or there, which sure. would, uh, you know, sort of go away. And my skincare routine, even when I was younger, which I was kind of conscious of those spots, it would consist of these weird apricot scrubs and this and that and really harsh exfoliants and cleansers. Yeah. And now I've gone to a point where uh, my skincare routine consists of wearing sunscreen and moisturizer and just washing my face a couple of times a day. Yep. And just previously, before I've gone back on that, I was taking retinoid briefly, which I started for a month, but that really caused an irritation of my skin. I was wearing lots of these other, I was doing an exfoliant, I was doing a scrub, I was doing this, and I, I, my skin didn't like it. Yeah. And since stopping all of that and taking it down to basics, yep. my skin feels really healthy and I, I like the way it looks. And it's interesting because uh, retinoids and exfoliating acids like yeah. your glycolics, your salicylics, your lactic acids, they are the biggest culprits that I see for skin barrier disruption. Yeah. And they're all, I mean, your skin produces lactic acid. It produces all of those fatty acids as part of its mantle. So the skin naturally exfoliates. Um, yeah. The top layer of your skin, your stratum corneum, sheds every 28 to 32 days. Now, there are some people that can benefit from exfoliating. Mm. If your skin is very oily, you've got those sticky, clumpy, dead skin cells, you're acne prone, you're blemish prone, there is a role for that. It doesn't mean everybody needs it. Yeah. And I think this is the problem. I think there is this idea that every new skincare ingredient that comes out, you need to add it into your skincare routine, and you really don't. Simple is better. It's sort of this, um, also, it points towards these social inequalities because 
these are quite expensive. Like, mm-hmm. you know, a small tube of, um, you know, a certain type of salicylic acid or something might cost you a, you know, significant, you know, cost of a, a meal in a restaurant potentially sometimes. So most people may not be able to afford a 10, 12 step skincare routine, yeah. but they feel like they need to break their wallet, break their purse yeah. to do that, to fit into society's expectations. I think... One of the things that drives me absolutely insane is the fact that people are led to believe that their skincare, in particular, can fix actual skin issues. Acne being a prime example, rosacea being another, acne scarring being another one. Because if you had diabetes, or if you had epilepsy, or you had any other medical condition, you would go and see the relevant doctor in that condition. Skin is not given the same degree of respect. It's an organ like every other part of your body... And acne is not a cosmetic issue. Rosacea is not a cosmetic issue. They are medical issues with medical treatments. And there are so many people that I see, exactly as you've said, they've spent an absolute fortune on skincare at the expense of other things. And it's not got their skin better because it's not a drug. It's a Mm. cosmetic product. And they're poorer for it. And their skin's no better for it. And their mental health is worse for it. At what point does someone with acne, should they seek treatment, medical intervention in the form of Rakuten or antibiotics for their acne? What's the threshold? So in the UK, I would say probably what most people will do initially is they will try skincare. Right. So you can try skincare, which contains things like benzoyl peroxide Mm -hmm. or salicylic acid, face washes, moisturizers, over the counter. And if you've been doing that for, say, a month, month and a half, give it about six weeks, things are not improving or your acne is getting worse or more extensive, so it's starting to affect more body sites, Mm. or if it's starting to scar or affect your mental health and your confidence, you feel like you don't want to go out, you feel like you don't want to socialize, you're canceling your plans. At that stage, probably most people would go and see their NHS GP, or that's when I would recommend you need to get some kind of medical professional help. At that stage, your NHS GP is very likely to give you either prescription creams Mm -hmm. or oral antibiotics, or in a female patient, they might recommend a contraceptive pill, if appropriate. At that stage, if those treatments aren't working, so let's say you've been doing those for about 12 weeks, and again, same parameters apply, it's not improving, it's getting more extensive, your mental health is getting worse or there is scarring, at that stage, normally you'd be referred to a dermatologist. And... I know NHS dermatology waiting lists are very long at Mm. the moment, but at that stage, then you would be considered for other treatments in the NHS, such as isotretinoin or Roaccutane, or possibly even off-label spironolactone in a female patient. Really? Now, in the independent sector, obviously, there is the opportunity where you can go straight to a dermatologist and you can have those treatments. And if it's a dermatologist who also does cosmetic work, they may also use peels or laser, particularly if the acne is non-inflammatory. So there are lots of options and lots of different routes, but it does depend on whether that route is NHS or independent. And if someone experiences acne breakouts and it resolves, Mm. and obviously, especially in darker skin, there's a higher incidence of this post-acne, post-inflammatory pigmentation where it leaves marks and scarring, what are options just at home DIY that someone could use to reduce the appearance of this darkening or pigmentation? Yes, so... I always think with skin of color, Mm. you just have to treat the underlying issue aggressively because actually the pigmentation causes just as much distress as the acne itself. So rather than chase your tail with, okay, right, I've got pigment, let me sort the pigment out, you've got to stop the process that's causing Mm. the pigment. So I still think goal number one should be sorting the acne itself. In terms of things you can buy over the counter, things like glycolic acid, lactic acid, they can help. The problem is that over-the-counter products, often the concentrations are relatively weak Mm. compared to, say, maybe what you would do on a prescription or in a clinic with a peel. So the results are never going to be as good. So I think that there is a risk potentially of ending up spending a lot of money but not getting the results that you want when actually what you should be doing is trying to tackle the acne first. Mm. You know, we've obviously spoken about how people have really extensive skincare routines nowadays. Mm. Um, If someone was starting out on their skincare journey and was completely overwhelmed by the amount of information and choice out there from, you know, all these words like ceramides to humectants to, you know, various actives, what are... I don't know, three basics for a skincare routine. Like, for example, myself, you know, the the limited range of things I use, yep. 
a moisturizer, sunscreen, and some sort of gentle foaming or hydrating, um, you know, exfoliant. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Is there anything in addition to that which you'd recommend to people? So I think that's probably actually a pretty good day-to-day routine. Cleanse in the morning, mm-hmm. moisturize sunscreen. If you are naturally quite oily skinned, you may not need to use a moisturizer and a sunscreen because sunscreens come in a moisturizing base and simply cleanser and sunscreen may be enough. In the evening, you do need to make sure you cleanse properly because yeah. you need to ensure that the dirt, sweat, pollution, grime, sunscreen... All the stuff you've come into contact with during the day is probably removed from your skin before you go to sleep. Including makeup as well. That too. A lot of people sleep with their makeup on. I think people are getting better Better. at not doing that. Um, But yeah, that night cleanse is important. And then if somebody is worried in general about kind of like anti-aging, I suppose, Mm. or premature skin aging, then you could cleanse, you could use a vitamin A product, and then you could moisturize afterwards. So apart from... Wearing sunscreen, which can limit photo aging and aging of the skin and retinoids, which probably is the closest thing we have in dermatology to an anti-aging treatment. What are some other anti-aging products that you've seen and that you'd recommend that actually work and that have some evidence behind them? So I think if we're going to be completely academic about it, the difference between a cosmetic and a drug. So Mm. when I say cosmetic, I mean something you could buy over the counter in a shop. Yeah. A cosmetic is not legally allowed to change the structure or function of your skin. Mm. So if you think about that definition, how much can skincare really do? Yeah. I think the second thing that's really important to recognize is your skin is a barrier and it's a really good barrier. Mm. It is really good at keeping things out. So I'm not saying that skincare doesn't do anything at all. You know, it's not as binary as that. But if we're asking what skincare products have got a little bit of evidence behind them, well, absolutely your sunscreen, your vitamin A, there is some data behind using antioxidant serums as well, in particular vitamin C. Vitamin C has probably got the most data behind as it. As a topical agent to as, put on the skin. As a topical agent. So vitamin C serums. Okay. They can be used underneath your sunscreen. Um, and not only can they help your sunscreen work better. Really? They can also reduce oxidative damage. So sunlight creates these harmful molecules known as free radicals, mm-hmm. which will damage the DNA, the proteins, the fats in your skin. And vitamin C topically can help reduce that. The difficulty, though, is there is a massive difference between formulations Mm. and companies aren't necessarily carrying out clinical trials because they don't need to. So it's very hard to discern which is a good vitamin C and which Mm. is not because it breaks down very quickly because it's an antioxidant. The minute it's opened up to air, it's going to break down and it's going to destabilize. So my kind of general tips for when you pick a vitamin C serum are, firstly, it needs to be in a dark bottle Mm -hmm. so sunlight is not breaking it down. Yeah. The second thing is you really want a system of vitamin C delivery where you're just not opening it up the whole time. So oxygen is getting in every time you open it and breaking the product down because there may well be a decent percentage of vitamin C at the time it was packaged in the factory. But six months later when you open it and then you're opening it and using it every day, you don't know if the potency is the same. But you see now there's a whole subset of anti-aging, uh, you know, wellness people online really wanting to extend their lifespan and health span as well. And mm-hmm. skincare has come into that as well. Mm-hmm. You see a number of people claiming you can put uh, period blood on your face to do that, or you put honey on your face. W- w- I mean, the, clearly a lot of this stuff is harmful and probably can worsen your skin. Is there anything else apart from those three that you'd recommend for more youthful skin? So I think there, for youthful skin, probably not. I Mm. mean, peptides, the peptide data, if you actually start looking into it, peptides are a massive group of compounds. Mm. And just because one may have some activity doesn't mean the other one does. Same with growth factors in skincare. Growth factors don't work in isolation in your skin. That's not how the human body works. It's not a single kind of ingredient that you put in and it's suddenly going to be miraculous. The thing there is your average wellness influencer is genetically blessed with great skin. They could be the person that, quite frankly, could sleep in their makeup every night and they would have no issues with their skin. It's not everything else they're doing. The second issue is there's another group of wellness influencers that are quite happy to work with brands and say it's that brand that's fixing their skin. When you know full well they were in your clinic yesterday having a whole load of other stuff done, which you obviously can't say for confidentiality and obvious other reasons, but you know for a fact it's certainly not that skincare product that got their skin better or looking that way. Certainly some conflicts of interest there. Indeed. So, Anjali, we've got a segment in the podcast. It's called If It Ducks Like a Quack, where we 
try to debunk quackery nonsense and medical myths that are commonly seen online and you know people promote them and almost believe them they become true so i'll read out a few of them now and get your thoughts on them So, again, we briefly men- mentioned this about acne and the psychological effect it can have. Yeah. And I suspect this is tied to it as well. Uh, you know, a myth that acne is caused by bad hygiene. People with acne are not dirty people. Yeah. If anything, people with acne are probably cleaner than people that don't have acne because they're constantly washing their face and they're yeah. constantly washing their skin because they're worried about the oil production that goes along with it. And that probably worsens their acne because they're drying out their skin then and resulting in more sebum production. So it's not so much more sebum production, but there is a risk of damage to the barrier function of the skin itself. Mm. Now, that said, again, there's always going to be a little bit of, but there is an exception. So the exception is, for example, if you do a lot of exercise and you've had a sweaty workout and then you don't shower immediately after your workout mm. and you decide to go and sit and have a coffee and sit around in your gym kit, yeah. it is possible to get truncal acne or chest acne. Mm. Because the sweat, the heat, the occlusion, compression from sports bras or tight-fitting clothing or lycra can potentially drive spots. So and Blocking the pores. Indeed. So I think in that scenario, it's not dirty. It's just from a hygiene point of view, you probably want to make sure you're showering straight after a sweaty workout. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. And then, so the other one, you don't need to moisturize if your skin is oily. What do you feel about that? So I disagree with that. Mm. So oil in skin is very different to water or hydration yeah. in skin. So the first thing I would say is just because your skin's oily doesn't necessarily mean it's hydrated. So mm. there is always benefit in using a moisturizer. You may want to use something that's oil-free or gel textured, which is a bit lighter. So the skin doesn't feel sticky or tacky or anything like that. But no, I think moisturizers are sensible. The second thing I would say is if you're acne prone, people are usually using treatments of some sort, mm. be that your salicylic or benzoyl peroxides over the counter or prescription treatments. Those treatments work by drying the skin out. So you then have to replace the moisture. In the I skin. mean, you can still have oily skin, but a dry component that yeah. is underhydrated to your skin, yeah. which will lead to it maybe looking more sunken yeah. and not as plump. Indeed. Uh, you know, so clearly you need to mo- moisturize. It should be a component yeah. of you know your skin. Yeah. But also there are different types of moisturizer. You know, you can get these occlusive ones, ones which maybe have humectants which can hold more water so if you have oily skin is there a certain type of moisturizer that may be more beneficial yeah so as a general rule most moisturizers do contain a combination of occlusives humectants and emollients Mm. if one is oily or blemish prone you're better off going for a slightly more humectant based moisturizer so something like hyaluronic acid so which traps water rather than you know blocks it as a barrier indeed so you wouldn't want to be using something super occlusive because you're more likely to block your pores Mm. If somebody's got a very dry skin, so they're eczema prone, they're psoriasis prone, or they just naturally have dry skin, particularly in the winter months, which can be quite common, you probably want to go for something that's a little bit more emollient Mm -hmm. or occlusive based. So your squalanes, your glycerins, for example, rather than purely relying on hyaluronic acid. Just stop that water loss across the skin barrier and keep it in. Brilliant. So, I mean, uh, we probably can talk about a whole host of myths about skincare. uh, But thank you very much for joining me and enlightening everyone on skincare essentials and and acne as well. Now, before I let you go, you had a question for me. I did. And my question is, do you think social media is a good place for giving medical advice? That is a very interesting question. And I think there is some nuance to be added there. I don't think it's a good place to give advice. I think you can give generic advice about physiology, about mechanisms of how the body works. So for example, you know, if someone were to give tips for constipation on a generic level, you can talk about anatomy, you can talk about fiber, you can talk about the gastrocolic reflex, you can talk about, you know, uh, advice that would be applicable to the average human body. But if you're giving then advice on someone who's suffering from IBS type C, who's got a uterine prolapse. I think it's unreasonable to offer virtual advice online specifically for very niche personal medical conditions because I think that could be to the detriment of the patient. And I've seen personally in some of the videos I make, some of the comments that I see, there's a lot of people out there, and it's sometimes quite heartbreaking, asking questions very specific niche questions because 
they connect with people they follow online yeah. and they have more trust in those people than their own medical professionals. Yeah. And that raises the question as what are the medical professionals they are facing on a day-to-day -day basis physically? What are they doing wrong or what are they not doing enough of that their trust has been eroded? And uh, what are these people online doing that's garnering more trust? So I think the question is, it's not a place for specific medical advice, and I think that would be dangerous to do. Mm. But I think it is a good place to improve someone's health literacy. And, yeah. you know, for example, a lot of the stuff you do, debunking skincare myths, yeah. providing evidence-based information between diet and skin or, you know, different types of sunscreen. So I think that's good, debunking things and yeah. stopping people falling prey to people who might want to sell them some, you know, dodgy skin supplement or you need to put this you know, yogurt cream to improve your skin probiotics. So I think it's good for that, but yeah. not good for specific advice. So I guess my follow-up to that would be, to all the people that are listening to this, how can they find or vet a credible social media account that is run by a medic? Are there any top three things they should be looking out for? When I see someone online, I'm sort of looking at their name and qualifications that they, you know, produce and verify. So you can look them up online and they'll be associated with either a hospital, a private clinic. They're on a GMC register. If you're based in the UK, you look them up and they're, you know, they're registered with a license to practice. Um, and there's a lot of people who may not have an active license to practice. So it's questionable whether they should be giving any advice online. Mm -hmm. There are many of them online. And also to see have they got any conflicts of interest? Are they yeah. selling something or aligning themselves with a brand or product and then giving you a discount code? I, I think that's a very dangerous territory because as a doctor, there's one aspect where you need to be beyond reproach. You need to be neutral and apolitical. Yeah. If you are, as, as, a, as a you know person who deals with guts and a GI surgeon, if I promote probiotics and then give someone a discount code, I am leveraging my credibility, expertise, and authority to say, guys, you should trust me and buy these probiotics because I'm a GI surgeon. And I'm saying they work. Here's my discount code. That's a huge conflict of interest and potentially a probity issue, I would say. And it's actually very hard to verify some, whether someone is actually a real doctor or not online. There's a lot, not a lot of transparency. Yeah, I agree. It's a real problem. Yeah. Dr. Anjali Marto, thank you so much for coming on and sharing the sort of myths, the secrets and all evidence-based stuff about skincare and acne. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So thank you to Dr. Anjali Marto. That was a really interesting insight into skincare and acne. Just before we go, we have a crowd science question from Nat in Landello in Wales. She's asked, hi, Dr. Curran, love the podcast. I wanted to get your take on collagen supplements. You're often saying that supplements are a waste of money and that we can get what we need from a healthy diet. Are there many foods that contain collagen that could be included in your diet? And are collagen supplements a scam to rinse people like me who are trying to hang on to their youth? Thanks, Nat. So the collagen supplements you get in pills or powders or shots or whatever you buy is actually a different type of collagen to that found in our bodies. Pure collagen would be very difficult for us to digest. So the ones that you see in these supplements are partially digested. They are hydrolyzed collagen, which makes it easy for us to consume and digest. But unfortunately, there is very, very little evidence to suggest that collagen supplements that you can buy and then consume can have any noticeable impact on a scientific cellular basis on the skin. I will say one thing, there was a review of 19 studies containing more than a thousand participants, which suggested that taking collagen supplements seemed to reduce the appearance of skin aging if taken for more than 90 days. But when you break it down, the individual studies in the 19 studies, there were a very small number of participants. And another limitation is that often a lot of these studies are funded, at least in part, by companies that produce collagen supplements. That's a conflict of interest. The claims by people who sell collagen supplements and people who are supportive of collagen supplements significantly outweigh any evidence that's actually there in the literature. The claims made by sellers of collagen supplements or supporters of collagen supplements surpass any evidence available or proven in the literature as of right now. Now, that's a great question. Hope it helps you and other people who may be considering purchasing collagen supplements. And in this week's Crowd Science Extra episode, we've got a question from Kay in Singapore who asks if the radiation from infrared, Bluetooth, and our mobile phones are affecting us negatively in any way. 
And remember, if you want to get in touch and have your question featured in this episode of Crowd Science Extra, get in touch at thereferralpod.com. That's a wrap on skincare this week. Make sure you click the subscribe button for weekly episodes and hit the notification icon so you don't miss out on any of that myth-busting juicy goodness. I'll see you next time.